Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis, and this week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at Final Flight Outfitters, the family-owned outdoor store that has all the apparel and outdoor equipment you need for your next hunting or fishing trip. Visit finalflight.net for more information. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum and heritage park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. In today's episode, Scott sits down with David Coffey and discusses his work in a new book titled In Harm's Way. And later, join us as we discover something new here at Discovery Park of America. I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week we celebrate our little corner of the woods, just like at our museum and heritage park here in Union City. On this podcast, we explore the culture, spirit, accomplishments, and heritage of our incredibly beautiful and fertile home here in West Tennessee. Today, we're talking about heritage. We're talking history because our guest is a professor of history and chair of the Department of History and Philosophy at the University of Tennessee at Martin. He teaches classes in U.S. military and Mexican history. Welcome, David. Thank you. It's great to be here. So David Coffey is my guest. Um, you know those websites, David, where you um, where you see where teachers are reviewed. Um, I Hi. I was you know doing a little research on you, and and a student wrote about you. So we'll find out if this is true or not. Um, the student wrote, "He's a really chill guy, and if you can talk to him outside of class, do it. You'll learn a lot just from conversations with him." So there you have it. That's so, sweet. So I'm I'm uh, hoping we learn a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> so so I mean you you uh, you spend a lot of time with history. So what what do you think is the role of history in our lives today? How's it relevant? Well, what I like to tell my classes is that history is our cultural DNA. It's it really is how we how we come to think of ourselves. It's how we inform ourselves. And that's why it's important to know, because the more you know about your history, the better prepared you are as a citizen. The more you know about the forces that shape your existence, the better prepared you are to deal with that existence. So hi- history is, knowing your history, the good and the bad, is absolutely essential. So it's, uh, it's, it's huge. And what I like to try to do in class and in life is to relate what happened in the past to what's happening now. You can see why we have certain things happen now by knowing a little bit more about what happened before. I I have an aunt who's in her 90s, and I took her to lunch because I was curious about, you know, my own genealogy, and I was asking questions, and she finally just said, why do you want to know all this (laughs) stuff? No, Nobody cares about all this stuff. It happened in the past. Do you... uh, do you can you tell when students are the kind of people who connect with this versus the students that just think it's in the past? Usually, yeah, and I, I think a lot of it has to do with how you engage. Uh, I have students who come into class who don't want to learn about history and end up getting into it, and I have colleagues same way. We do a lot of our recruiting in class, so. It's it's really for us. It's a conversion experience almost. We um, we have to deal with, and I don't want to uh, I don't want to offend anyone here, but we have a lot of students who come to college unprepared. And history is one of those more neglected topics in in high school. Sometimes it's not taught very well. It's, there's not an H in STEM. Exactly, exactly. It, and so it's it's sort of a stepchild and. In, in the public schools, and, and so we have to do a little remedial teaching at, at, at the college level. And, and so it's, uh, I, when I do see that spark, though, it's, it's meaningful. It, it's, when I see a student engaging, it, 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 it gets me going and makes me want to do a better job. But, you know, it's, there are those who are sitting there or they're looking at their phones or they're sleeping or they're 
thinking about lunch. And uh, <laughs> there's no, no way around that. That's just going to happen. Yeah. But, but uh, my role, my goal and my role is to engage. And so I, I, I try to make my experience as, uh, as meaningful as possible. It's got to be uh... – it's got to feel good when you see somebody who came in, you know, thinking it, they were, it was not good, thinking it was going to be boring, and have them suddenly engage. And probably many of them have gone on to major in history, and sure, yeah, become historians themselves. I have one good example: a young man who is in my first class at UT Martin back in two thousand one. He came in as a math major. He changed his his major that semester to history. Went on to graduate. Went to graduate school at Ole Miss. Got a PhD. Now he's he's back working for us. Couldn't draw it up much better than that. So you've have you always, as far as you can remember in your own history, have you always been interested in the topic of history? Yes, I have uh, from from an early age, and I I'm asked that often. And how did I get into history? And I don't know, uh, except for there were books on the shelves in my grandparents' home and my parents' home. There were movies as a child. Visits to the Alamo or uh, battlefields. I, I I was drawn to the military history early on. Maybe it was the uniforms of the pageantry or something. But uh, I've evolved over the years. But initially, it was it, it was always there. I, I have pictures of me as a little kid in uniform. You know, it, uh, so I, I I don't know what it was. Yeah, it's it's interesting how some kids connect with one thing, and in your case, you connected with it, and then stayed on that path until you've really you're at the top of the mountain. Um, where where were you born? I don't believe you're from this area originally. Where where are you from, and what was your path? Well, I was born in New Mexico. My parents were living there briefly, and uh, they took me with them to Vernon, Texas, where my dad worked for about a year, and then we ultimately settled in Fort Worth, Texas, where I grew up. And and I went to high school <laughs> in, in Fort Worth all four years. Um, and what high school did you Pas- go to? Pascal High School. It's where I went. Um, Pascal Panthers. Small world. I'm class of 81. I'm 79. So uh, We were there around the same right, time. Yeah, we, we, were, our paths, we, we might have played on the soccer field together or something. We might or have. Softball. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was a great place. We're, I'm going back in June for my 40th anniversary. Wow. Uh, so uh, they've, they've lost my uh, contact information, I guess. <laughs> that's probably so, not a bad yeah, thing. Yeah, I don't get, I don't get but, invited. But, yeah, I, I, so I spent um, most of my life in Fort Worth, and – when I finished graduate school, I moved to Abilene, Texas for a job. I worked out there for a couple of years and then got this job. And I've been here since 2001. When you when you were at um, Pasco, I don't know if you remember this. Do you remember a teacher named Bob Reed by chance? He was an English teacher. English teacher, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't have him, but I remember him. He was very popular. Yeah, he was a great English teacher. He, he's, you know, you talk about how you change people's lives and, you know, when you, you learn about history and that... He's somebody in high school. I was very shy, didn't do a lot of stuff. He spotted me and said, I want you to come and draw what I'm talking about. And so I did it in front of everybody, and it really did change the wow. direction of my life. Um, I tracked him down once and sent him an email, but um, I don't know if he checks his email. He's retired. <laughs> so um, anyway, if, he, if, he's, if he's listening, yeah. you know, thank you, Bob Reed, and, and teachers around the world. So um, so you connected with history. Um, you've, you've ended up here. Um, you've done so much work. I don't want to talk about the past too much. I want to talk about the present of history. Um, let's talk about you were the assistant editor of the six volume American Civil War, the definitive encyclopedia and document collection. Yes, that yes. thing is huge. It is. Um, my birthday's coming up, so I told my wife that's what I want for my birthday. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if I get it or not, but. Um, it's not. It's not like a cheap book. I mean, you got to like the Civil War. To can you describe the book for me a little bit? It's. It was a monumental task. I can tell you that. And I I read and edited every entry. Wow. And I wrote about forty five of the entries myself. So it it it's comprehensive. It covers all aspects of the Civil War period. Uh, it's not just military. It's remarkably comprehensive. It's got some good maps. It's got good contributors. All I can say is it's it's the toughest project I ever worked on and the biggest project. And it took it it took a toll on me. <laughs> it, it really did. I was I was working on it almost round the clock, 
working around my full time job. For how long? How long did it take? From oh, it 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 took about three years, mm. um, off and on. Encyclopedia works really interesting because you solicit the entries and then you have to kind of wait for them to come in and you edit them as they come in and then have to do a lot of rewriting and a lot of uh, double checking fact checking you it's it's uh, it's an interesting process but it, it's really time consuming and it, I was supposed to be one of two assistant editors I ended up being the only one so it, it was a lot of work did it um did it uh, when it was done? Uh, what did you do to celebrate? I, I think I slept. Uh, I don't know. It was, it was a huge relief though. It, yeah. it, it was a big one because the, the the manuscript was just in a huge box, uh, like a one of those reams of of copy paper boxes. That that's how big it was. It was just huge. Well, I've done a couple of. Uh biographies and that have taken a couple of years, but, you know, in between trying to do all your work, I've, I've explained that it felt like you were reading a book from the inside out and it just really, the way it absorbs your mind, it, it really does impact everything else in oh, your life. It, it does. So I can't imagine something that monumental Are the volumes. Are they, you know, I couldn't tell from looking at Amazon. I mean, they're, 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 big. They're, they're big. It's, it, it takes up a, a foot on my shelf basically. So yeah, it's a pretty big project, pretty big, and it's a it, but it's lovely. It it really is, and it is the definitive Civil War reference work. And were there some moments when you were writing and researching, and and I don't know which which do you like better, the the research part of it or the writing? The part of it? the writing part. The writing by part by far. Yes. Yeah, I think I like the research part. Um, <laughs> were there any moments uh, where you figured something out, put some pieces together that? had not really been put together that way in the past. There were a few instances and not not to again throw anybody under the bus, but there were a couple of of entries that were incorrect or there they that were that have been reinterpreted since the author wrote that or they picked up on some old scholarship in 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 their uh, entry and needed to be updated or just in a couple of cases outright changed. Yeah, one of the problems we have in in Civil War history is fighting uh, fighting a sort of a culture war, mm. and uh, people who cling to old notions about uh, the lost cause and and things of that nature. And I had to uh, I had to update some of that thinking, but it is it is fascinating because I, you know I I like to research even when I'm not researching for anything i just like find a topic and just get further sucked further and further in um it is very interesting to read how even historians a hundred years ago wrote oh, yeah. about history oh. very much colored by their own uh prejudices or opinions or absolutely and there's not a topic uh that's more indicative of that than the civil war uh that that it, it is a it's a controversial topic, and it it it'll get people fired up more than anything. It's well, and and you know, as a person who is from the South, and as a person who can identify my ancestors' slaves, you know, I mean, yeah. I have put it on, you know, I've written about and posted the names of the slaves of my ancestors, and I've been contacted by oh, their descendants. How cool! Who uh, said, "Hey, you know, thank you for doing that. I've, you've helped me." You've helped me hit, get through a wall. So, um, you know, it is um, it is interesting to figure out how should I feel, you know, what is my role, right? you know, today right. yeah. in that, because I'm also passionate about the South and, you know, and so anyway, as we just had here at Discovery Park of America, Civil War Days, so we did a, you know, we thought a lot about that and, you know, we're already planning um, for next year, so... Um, we're going to look for some ways we can um, address some of those issues here um, that are important to be dra- addressed. Yeah, I, I spend a lot of time now on uh, on the social aspects of, of the war and, and the impact, the influence going forward. A lot of people want to dwell on the, the military, you know, whether it's the reenacting or the gone with the wind kind of romance that's mm-hmm. attached to the Civil War. I, I I try to get people to understand how the way people came to grips with the Civil War 
influenced the way we developed as a society in the, in the South and in the greater United States. And it's not a pretty picture. The people who have glorified the, the Confederacy and secession and civil war and have clung to that belief, have, have, I think, held us back from a, a more comprehensive understanding of our society and the troubles, the problems that we have. And because of that, we're still dealing with with race and regional uh, divisiveness and things like that that we don't really need to be dealing with. But Well, if you think about it, when you think about the big picture of you know time, the Civil War was not really that no. that far away. You know? Exactly. Um, the ancestors that I, that I like to research, um, some of them fought for the Union, some of them fought for the Confederacy, um, and what I try to do is track down anything I can on them to figure out um, what happened to them afterwards. What you know, you yeah. love to be able to. Of course, most of them couldn't read or write, and said so we don't necessarily know, you know. But uh, one thing I found uh, helpful is the uh, Tennessee Confederate surveys that they sent out. Yes, um, yes. Those have been – I've actually, uh, for the area that, that I'm interested in, have pulled those and just read them all, even though some of the people <laughs> – where it's fascinating to read – how the the words they used and how they you know positioned things and uh, it's very interesting. To yeah, me. how they a lot of them had had uh, had some interesting thoughts on the experience and of course a lot of them uh, spent considerable time trying to gloss over what what had happened and to try to put the best best interpretation of the of the well what came to be known as the lost cause right uh, so. It's yeah, it's it's complicated. And it's and it's uh, certainly controversial, but it's it's there. And and it's it's um, only been resurrected recently with the statues. and, yeah. you know what to do with the statues, and are, you know are the should we have them? Should we not have them? Um, should they go in museums? You know, it's an interesting uh, conversation. It is. We have a statue here in Union City that's that's problematic as far as I'm concerned. It's it, it's. It's reflective not of uh, honoring Civil War veterans, but of reinforcing white supremacy. And a lot of these statues are there for that reason rather than – I mean, this the statue we have in Union City, for example, was erected in 1909, I believe. Right. Uh, so it, it, it wasn't a direct response to the, to the Civil War. It was a, a confirmation of a, of a new Southern identity that, that rose out of the Jim Crow era, so – Right. You know, no one wants to hear that. Right, right. But that, but, but that's really your role, you know, is to state the facts, you know, as a, as a historian, as a person who can interpret for us what things mean socially. Um, that's more interesting to me than the factual. I mean, the factual part's important, but I'm also fascinated by what you do with the social ramifications of all these kind of things. Well, if you look at that, that statue down in the park in Union City, it's, it says – to the soldiers who suffered in prisoner of war camps who fought to preserve Anglo-Saxon culture mm-hmm. or Anglo-Saxon civilization, I believe. It's a statement of white supremacy. And so the question is, <laughs> so, is, is it, uh, would it be an effective teaching tool to put something else up there yes. that then points out, you know, which, you know, museums, the role of museums is to do exactly what you and I are doing right now, is to point those things out and to explain what they mean and why. And and uh, it's up to others to figure out exactly what to yeah. do. And I, I've been dragged into this this monuments controversy a few times now. I've, I've, I bet. I've been a speaker at a, at a couple of occasions and uh I've I've done a little research as a as a result, but the uh, w- the question about what the pr- what's the proper way to do it uh, that I don't know if there's a r- correct answer. I, I love what Mayor Landrew did in in New Orleans uh, a couple of years ago. His his reasoning behind that was was well articulated. I think what they've done in Memphis has been progressive, but I, I like what you suggested in that. We don't necessarily need to take down statues or move them, but we need to maybe add to the interpretation uh, of the site. It would it would make me feel better if we said this is if we had a little kiosk next to that statue that explained 
the reasoning behind this, how statues like that came to be. Mm-hmm. It was all funded by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. They were very active. Yeah. So it's uh, maybe well-intentioned, but it, it, it's definitely a symbol. And it's it's not necessarily a symbol of, of history as much as it is a statement of personal philosophy or, or cultural supremacy. Or way. There are a lot of ways to look at it. And things are changing. We'll see if they if they continue. Uh, we hope we, we certainly hope that they will. The conversation's not going to die down, that's for sure. We'll continue that. Um, one, one thing, your, your book that uh, just came out um, in Harm's Way, A History of the American Military Experience, you did this book with Gene Allen Smith and Kyle Longley. Um, it's a great book. Um, I just got it, and I tore through it. Um, the thing that I liked about it the most, you or whoever wrote the preface addressed um, when you said, instead of focusing exclusively on conflict, the book embraces political and diplomatic challenges, social and economic changes, philosophical and ideological debates and technological advances. You wrote, most importantly, the authors want this book to be read, studied, and enjoyed. So I think that um, is an interesting thing that is reflected in a lot of your work, is that it's enjoyable. That's my hope. I don't, I don't like reading history written for other historians. I never have, and I try not to write that way. I, I really do hope that this book is enjoyable. It's it fills a niche in the uh, military history classroom, and I hope in in uh, popular consumption as well. It's 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 written for a general reader. And Civil War is only a tiny bit of this book. Uh, this book covers all the way from the beginning. Um, to the present. Yeah. Was there anything that jumped out at you as your favorite? Like, was there any part of this book or any era that you just really connected with? Well, I wrote the middle chapters. I wrote chapter 7 through 11, and that covers 1850 to 1940, basically. So I got a big chunk there. And it, it so I had the Civil War years, the uh, Indian War years after the Civil War, the parts that I find interesting uh, are the periods we don't look at a lot, like the 1850s, the stuff that went on in the 1850s before the Civil War. Like we made an attempt to use camels in the Southwest to, to move people and move freight. Didn't last long, but it was a novel experiment. Uh, the, uh, in the, during the uh, interwar years between World War I and World War II, a lot of cool stuff happened a lot of uh, interesting uses of the military, like the support for the CCC and the technological developments, new weaponry, new new ways to approach warfare, uh, the lack of learning from past conflicts. Uh, it, you know, there's a lot in there that it's the military interventions in Latin America particularly interest me. That's what, what's so interesting to me, and I, uh, this has to happen to you all the time when you're watching you're watching the news, and the feeling is this is the first time anything's ever happened. When in fact, you know, we're not the first ones here. Oh yeah, you know, the, and we won't be the last ones here. You know, these kind of th- these conflicts, these you know, the social changes, and it's been happening. You know, now the the speed at which they're oh, happening yeah. is speeding up. Sure, but it's 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 pretty relative. Yeah, yeah. No, it is. It is, and that that comes out a little bit when I was when I was reading this. You've also you've done a lot of other books. Um, John Bell Hood and the Struggle for Atlanta, Soldier Princess, the Life and Legend of Agnes um, Salem Salem in North America, Sheridan's Lieutenants, um, which I actually already had. Oh, really? Uh, before I even knew you, I oh, had cool. it. Um, I brought it with me. It was on my shelf. Um, are there any of these that you've written that are like your very favorite? I've been really lucky in my in my career. I haven't written anything that I haven't been able to publish. So the John Bell Hood book was basically my master's thesis, and the 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 Prince Soldier Princess was my doctoral dissertation, uh, augmented slightly. I'm particularly fond of the Sheridan's Lieutenants book because it 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 involves some of my personal. Um, 
interests more and uh, allowed me to follow the careers of, of some of the men that I've studied the most, uh, the Union cavalry officers in the Civil War who transitioned to the post-war army and, and became uh, the leaders of the, the conflict against the Indians in the West, uh, men like uh, George Crook and uh, Ranald McKenzie, uh, the more popular George Custer, <laughs> uh, those guys, uh, their career, the way they started in the Civil War as young officers and transitioned a couple of them all the way through the Spanish-American War into the 20th century. That, that fascinated me, so I enjoyed writing that book a lot. Now, selfishly, um, I want to ask you about Discovery Park of America and your role um, oh, here. Oh, sure. Um, you, uh, I wasn't here at the time, but I understand you were very much involved in what, what – how did you first hear about Discovery Park? Well, I got contacted by – I believe it was Polly, Polly Brasher, who, who asked if I would be willing to work with the design team uh, to help interpret the, the museum's Civil War and military – history exhibits and and I jumped at that opportunity I because I saw it as a real opportunity to change the narrative we have here in West Tennessee from everything being all about Nathan Better Forest to to a more comprehensive overview of the Civil War in West Tennessee and I argued that it's a whole lot more interesting if you do it that way even though you're dealing with union victories because it was right here in West Tennessee where the union won the Civil War Really, whether it's Fort Donelson or Island Number Ten opening the rivers of 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 the South, or Battle of Shiloh, which was a important uh, as the the first great bloody battle of the war and part of the rise of of U.S. Grant, and so I argued that that the comprehensive approach, you know, emphasizing the river warfare, the gunboats, the um, Union victories, the rise of Grant. It was a whole lot more important, even if people didn't, local people didn't want to acknowledge that. It would, it, it might help attract visitors from other parts of the country if it, if it wasn't just about a, a Confederate story, if it, was mm-hmm. a, if it was a total war story uh, and to embrace the Union side and the Confederate side, and and so I, I, I think the design team did a great job of following some recommendations I, I made, and I, I, I helped. I went through the the, the drawings and 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 the, the the copy, and I felt like I, I uh, made a nice contribution. I, n- no doubt. I mean, it's an incredible portion of i mean it's a big it's probably all all in the biggest section yeah that's here um and it covers a lot of ground you know from uh the revolutionary war um all the way to today and so it's uh definitely an area that's very popular we get a lot of people you know here who spend hours in those sections you know getting a sense we've um added to um, the experience now, um, you probably haven't been here since uh, we added this, but you'll hear as you're walking around different uh, news reports from, oh. you know, as far back as we could get, you know, on the radio and then World War II and Excellent. television. And, you know, so it kind of supplements the experience of walking through and seeing everything. Um, so you'll have to check that I out. I will, absolutely. Now, um, music history is is uh, I don't know if it's mu- is it music history or is it just music well, that you're also in? It's well a little of both. A little of both. Uh, okay, I'm, tell, tell I, me about that. I am I am in no way, shape, or form a music historian, but I have a deep appreciation for the history of particularly American uh, rock music and uh, the influence of uh, the, the African American influence on. Rock and blues and and even country and and pop. You're certainly living in the right um, area. Oh yeah, when you get to live basically in the in the music triangle, it is mm-hmm. uh, West Tennessee w- between Nashville and Memphis, and with uh, Jackson there and Carl Perkins, and down in 
and Johnny Cash and just over in Arkansas and Levon Helm down from Arkansas. And, right, Sleepy John Estes yeah, from yeah. Tina Turner. Oh, yeah, and, and the, all that stuff around Muscle Shoals in Sheffield, Alabama. All that's in as, this region, so this, it really makes this the – the epicenter of American music. And it's funny when people come here from, you know, Australia, you know, make it's like Mecca. Oh, yeah. And they have no, they don't understand that some people don't even really realize the the cultural uh, implications of this area. It's it's huge. If you if you just look at Memphis and you know, I, I think there's a tendency to think of Nashville as as Music City. I think that's what it, they call Nashville, but uh, but Memphis is tremendously influential in in not just blues. Uh, in in the history of rock and roll, if you were somebody, you came to Memphis to record. Whether it's Dusty Springfield or the Rolling Stones, right? You had, if you wanted to get legit, you had to go to Memphis or Muscle Shoals. Yeah, and, and it's work. crazy. Yeah, isn't it? it's, I love the whole Stack story. Oh a yeah, lot the, of, a lot of Stacks. People, yeah, Stack Stacks to me is an incredible. Place oh, to visit. I love to tell the Stack story in class because Stack shows us what we can do as a people. You know, you had black kids and white kids playing music together at a time when that wasn't really culturally allowed, but they did it and they made it work and they made green onions. Yeah, I was just actually, it's while you were talking, I was hearing green onions yeah, in, exactly. in my head. And, and, you know, music does that. My favorite band growing up was the Allman Brothers Band, and a mixed race band. And uh, that gave me hope as a, as a young person that, they, you know, we can live and work and play together yeah. and, and so that was you know when i think of the south those are the things i embrace the right. the 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 music the the that side of the culture mm-hmm. so it's uh it's important to me and i i i i've enjoyed learning about it yeah it, it the nice thing about living in this area that i've missed when i lived at other places is that you can you can read about something and then go there and visit and really experience it firsthand. And there are a lot of things. There are a lot of churches in the oh, South, yes. you know, African American churches that are still singing that same music. And you know, I, give me that any day. There wouldn't be Elvis without without that. That's exactly you know, right. There wouldn't be there wouldn't be Jerry Lee Lewis or or, or Wilson Pickett or James Brown. So it it's. Absolutely, it's it's amazing. Whether it was a a rural church or a, a, a roadhouse or a, a honky tonk, these this this is really the, the we birthed so many important musical events in our region. It's 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 really something we should celebrate. Well, and it's a lot of things all came together from the you know the the agriculture. You know, the type of work that was done, yeah. and how it was done, that, you know. Anyway, yeah, agreed. But now you're not letting that stay in the history. You got a band of your own. Yes. yes. What, what, what band are you in? Well, we have uh, a number of musical endeavors. I, I'm fortunate to get to work with some really talented people over at UT Martin. My wife uh, is the head of the music program there and is a internationally known percussionist. So music's a big part of our lives. And she's but, been on our podcast, yeah. Julie Hill. Oh, that's yeah, I, She has, indeed. And so uh, a, a few years ago, actually before I met Julie, I started playing music with some of my colleagues at UT Martin, and we formed a group that we called the House Band. That's, that's sort of the UT Martin House Band. And we play some original stuff. Uh, David Carithers, an uh, English professor and head of the English department, English and Modern Foreign Languages department, and I wrote some songs, and uh, we 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 play mostly covers, rock and roll stuff, a little country, a little blues, uh, and then we um, have a have a great time together. We've played some pretty good size events. We do soybean festival and some other things. Then we have a, a group that we get together occasionally. We call Ivory Tower of Power, <laughs> which in, involves a horn section and uh, some some of the music faculty and students from the music department and and some of the house band guys, and Julie playing drums. And then we have uh, David Carithers and I do sort of a singer songwriter thing. Uh, we're going to be doing that at Discovery Park in June mm-hmm. with. Uh, Philip Coleman, yep. appearance. Yep. So uh, looking forward to that. We uh, that's more of the acoustic uh, singer songwriter stuff. We prefer the electric 
it's going to be it's going to be fun having you guys here. Uh, we've got a whole music festival lined up. We're looking forward to it. A lot of uh, a lot of UT Martin uh, entertainers and performers, and you know, Julie's helped us nail down some some good folk. And there are some some good combos there: the jazz combo and the Steelworks and uh, the Charo group. Those are all really really good pieces of. Uh, well, they're 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 nice ensembles. So um, when you or you and Julie, when you get ready to go on a uh, historical um, oriented visit, what, what is your favorite type place to go um, when you want to both enjoy uh, an experience, but also have some history mixed in? Oh, that's, that's always a tough one to balance history with uh, entertainment or leisure because I, I tend to get fixated. If I go to a, a battlefield, for example, that, that can take a whole day, and it's not a lot of fun for somebody who's not a historian. But we've, we've really gone to some cool spots that had history. One of my favorite spots is the Dry Tortugas at Fort Jefferson. I mean, it takes a little effort to get there. It's a two-hour boat ride from Key West, but there's this old gigantic brick fort that they built mm. prior to the Civil War never quite got finished and never quite got fully used but it's there and it's it's on this little key uh, in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the, the Gulf of Mexico I guess or, or the Caribbean I don't know where, where that is right particularly but um, but it's a fascinating spot we walked around that all day last summer we went to Fort Sumter that's fun uh, yeah I, I love those kind of trips but we also, on the way back, stopped in Macon, Georgia, and I did a little Allman Brothers history there. Yeah. Visited Greg Allman's grave and Capricorn Records and uh, the, play, the, the Rose Hill Cemetery. That's kind of hallowed ground for, for music historians. I like, to, I like to see music sites, yeah. music history sites, but also military stuff. So it's uh, – there's – my favorite spots are, are probably, you know, I don't know. Graceland? Have you, yeah, I've been you, to Graceland. you take people to Graceland? I, I, I've taken one person to Graceland. Yeah, that's, but I, That's an oblig obligatory visit. But I, uh, I've had an opportunity to go to a lot of places. I've been to the Normandy beaches. That was awfully cool. A lot of World War II sites in, in, in Europe. Uh, been all over Italy, Rome and Venice. And my favorite spot, though— was probably Mexico in Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, just just the culture and the history and and the atmosphere there really was transformative for me. I spent a month there in graduate school and I came back a changed person. So oh wow, that's great. Well, of course, Discovery Park of America is on your list as well. Oh, I'm yes. sure. I, um, I, I love coming to Discovery Park. Excellent. Well, thank you for the work that you did to make it become a reality so that you could share with everybody who visits here from around the world. And thank you for coming here to talk to us today. Robert Kirkland, the primary donor and catalyst for DPA, said in an interview when talking about why he loved history, we are in part who we were. And inspiring children and adults to experience inspiration from history is a big part of what our education team still does every single day here at our museum and park. Here's Andrew Gibson to share a bit of that history now. Thank you, Scott. I am Andrew Gibson with the Education Department here at beautiful Discovery Park of America. And today I am with Casey King, a wildlife educator, director, uh, animal superhero, in my opinion, um, who will be telling us more about uh, the animals we have on display here and more about herself. So, Casey, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? Doing good. Uh, so let's start off with what is your job title here at Discovery Park? So I am the Aquarium and Wildlife Director. And what does that all entail? What does that mean? So I provide the animals that you see on exhibit in our regional gallery. So my job is to acquire those animals, but then also to take care of them to make sure that they have everything that they need to be healthy. So what are some of the crucial things that require them to be healthy? So every animal is going to be different. Um, reptiles are going to require special lighting, special heat temperatures, but then also areas that they can get away from the heat. Um, some of your salamanders are going to require more moist environments. 
They might need it to be a little colder. Um, and then some of our animals are nocturnal, so they need less lighting throughout the day. All right. Uh, and then does this feeding go along with that? Do, 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 are we on any specific diets for these animals? Are they on the on the keto diet or, or any, <laughs> any of those? So depending on the animal, once again, depends on the frequency that they eat. So your animals that have a higher metabolism eat more often. They'll eat either daily or multiple days throughout the week. Your animals who are lazier, like your salamanders, only get fed about once a week because they never move. All right. Uh, I don't feel for the salamanders. I couldn't personally be a salamander. Uh, And then, um, so how do we get these animals? Do you just go out in the wild and pick them up or, or have people kind of brought them in? What's the kind of plan of acquisition with those? So we actually have a special permit through TWRA that allows us to have the animals that we have. So we either have to get our animals directly from TWRA or we have to purchase them. So we're not allowed to take animal donations and we're not allowed to go out and collect animals out of the wild. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, my wife was asking me the other day about getting a pet turtle. Uh, And someone told me that in the state of Tennessee, it's illegal to own a turtle. Is that true? It used to be illegal. I think just recently, the rules and regulations have changed. You still have to purchase the turtle, but it has to be purchased in state. And you have to have proof of purchase. That way, if asked about it later on, you can show where you bought it and when you bought it. So as someone who is looking at purchasing an animal, you need to do your research. And through my research, I have um, come across an interesting find about the turtle's respiration system. Uh, could you touch on that for a minute? So what you're probably referring to is aquatic turtles. So a lot of aquatic turtles like to spend several hours under the water. It provides them a place to sleep at night to get away from predation. So they actually have three different ways that they can breathe. The first way and the most used way is through their lungs. So they breathe like we do. But while they're underwater, they can actually absorb oxygen from the water and breathe that way. So dermal respiration means that they have a lot of veins at the surface of their skin. And so those veins are able to directly absorb the oxygen from the water. But then also cloacal respiration. Um, One question that I get quite frequently is people hear that turtles can breathe with the use of their butt. So with cloacal respiration, they have these specialized sacs that are located in the region, and the water will run through those sacs, and the sacs are highly vascularized, which means that they can pull oxygen from the water as well. So besides the the interesting facts of turtles potentially or, or not breathing through their butt, it's the cloaca, um, you, you mentioned something about specifically talking about aquatic turtles. Um, can you, what do you mean? I thought all turtles were aquatic. That's the difference between a turtle and a tortoise, correct? Well, so tortoises are land only. They actually cannot swim. They do need water for survival like we do, but unlike us, they can go longer periods of time without having water. And actually what's interesting is those specialized sacs that I mentioned in aquatic turtles, a lot of Terrestrial turtles will have those sacs, but instead of being used for breathing, they're actually used for water storage. So what about um, like the eastern box turtle, right? That confuses me. Why is it listed as a turtle when it stays on land? So our eastern box turtles are completely terrestrial for the most part. They still can't swim, but they need water more frequently than tortoises do. So you can often find them drinking water or even just soaking in water. They just can't go in water over their heads. Okay. Well, we actually do have a Eastern Box Turtle on display here at Discovery Park of America. Um, You can come here, see him in the uh, Regional History Gallery, um, and learn all about all the other great animals we have on display here. Um, Come meet Casey. Come meet the other wildlife educators. And we hope to see you here at Discovery Park of America real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.